In this video, I am going to talk about my decision to have a home birth and a little bit as well about my decision not to hire a midwife. So, you know, to have an unassisted home birth or free birth, whatever you want to call it. I'll talk about doing my own prenatal care, the supplies that I have on hand for labor in birth and for postpartum as well. Now I was deep cleaning my house before I made this video. So I'm a little bit sniffly throughout the video. So excuse that, but lots of chatting in this video. Just check the timestamps. If there's something particular you are looking for, that will be linked in the description. Just hit the more button and you can fast forward to whatever part of the video you want to hear. I have gotten a lot of requests for this video and I was able to squeeze it in. So as I'm filming this, I am 40 weeks and one day pregnant. And I'm guessing, you know, it could be any time. I don't know. I don't, you know, have any big tells until labor starts. I always just feel the same in the end. Just the last several weeks, I feel the same. A little bit crampy, a little bit tired, but no big tells until I get that first big contraction. And then I know, but you know, my last two babies have gone to 41 weeks in one day and 40 weeks in five days. So I'm 40 in one. I could still have another week. I could have another two weeks. I've never gone past, much past 41 weeks, but you know, there are some women who go all the way to 43 weeks. I don't think that's gonna be me, but <laughs> you never know. Maybe we'll be here again next week and I will have my belly with me filming again, but I was just glad to be able to fit this in. So today we're going to talk about home birth, all about the supplies that I have on hand for not only labor, birth, and the immediate postpartum, but uh, my postpartum season as well. So I do not have a midwife that I have hired. This will be the second time that I have done this. Um, you know, it's, it's, I guess technically called like unassisted birth. Some people call it free birth when you give birth without a trained medical professional that you have hired to be present to manage the birth. That is the route that I've chosen, but to me, it, it just feels funny to label it like unassisted free birth. To me, it's just birth. I'm just giving birth, which is a natural bodily function. Yes, I know it's... Um, you know, not as ordinary as breathing. We do that several times a day, every day, but it is a natural bodily function. And the place that I'm at, this would be my fifth child. I've had a wide range of experiences as far as birth. My first one was just the traditional, went the hospital route, followed all the doctor's orders, and he was born early, spent time in the NICU. And I just did all that, like all of the kind of like traumatic experience. It was a vaginal birth, but there were some things that happened that really surprised me in that. Um, second one, I was told, oh, well now you've had a baby early, so you have to see a specialist and you're high risk. You're always gonna be high risk. And I, I went with that and barely made it to 38 weeks with that baby, another hospital birth. The third one kind of gained my confidence, took control of my lifestyle, made a lot of changes, and I carried that one all the way past past 41 weeks, 41 weeks in one day, had that baby in a birth center, and then my last one was a home birth. So I've done all the things. The only thing I haven't done yet is a C-section, and it's not something I anticipate, and I'll tell you why we'll talk about that, but it could happen. Um, it could happen to anyone. Anybody could need a C-section, and that could, person could be me. So, you know, maybe one day that will be part of my story who knows, but I've had a lot of experiences and home birth is by far my, my favorite. I mean, I'm doing it again. I'm choosing to do it again. As far as not using a midwife, this is a choice that, you know, I, I don't talk about it as much as some people do, even though I love birth. Here's why. This is so strange to me, but I found that when I talk, and this is even in like the home birth community, when I talk about my choice to have a home birth. First of all, I don't bring it up. Like I don't go around saying, I'm not using a midwife. Like it's something to be proud of or something. It's just a choice I've made and it does get brought up, people ask. People feel the need to explain to me why they do feel more comfortable having a midwife or why it's just not for them. And that's fine. You can explain that to me, but I don't think anyone owes me an explanation. And I don't think it's like some superior choice 
I just don't. In fact, I think most women should have a midwife, you know, historically. We can look back to biblical times and um, the Israelites had their midwives. A midwife, the word midwife just means to be with woman. So it's another woman who's with the birthing woman, assisting, helping, doing whatever she should be doing, whatever that woman needs in that moment. She shouldn't be inserting and meddling. That happens a lot. But it's just a woman who is familiar with and comfortable with birth who will be with that woman during her birth. And I think that needs to happen for most women because most women who are giving birth, uh, pregnant giving birth, they do really well with that kind of support. Just another woman's presence, comforting presence and uh, physical touch or suggestion, encouragement, guidance through that process. That is going to be what is the absolute best situation for most women. But I do think that there are some people um, who, you know, it's better not to have that. And I think I'm one of those people. That's obviously why I have made that choice. And just a few reasons I've made that choice is because I am a very type A personality. I'm not high, I'm actually not high strung uh, or OCD or uptight at all. I'm pretty laid back, actually, like super laid back. But when it comes to things that are important, like really important to me, I'm gonna be the one calling the shots, period. When I was a nurse, I worked in like the most critical care settings one could work in, and that's just my personality. I don't want, I, I want to be controlling a situation when the stakes are high. Um, I always perform really, really well under pressure, and it's funny because my husband will make fun of me, like I'll drop something in the kitchen and like milk or whatever and be like, oh, get all flustered. But then one of my children will have a serious injury and be like, uh, just recently, actually this past fall, one of my children got a pretty severe cut and it nicked the artery here in his wrist. And um, I was just totally cool, calm and collected. That's when I thrive. That's when I do really well. And that's not true for all people. And that's not true for all midwives. There are midwives who are very nervous people. They love birth, they're passionate, they're knowledgeable, yes, and they're equipped with tools, maybe pharmaceuticals, um, skills, but they are just nervous and they meddle. You know, that's a word that comes to mind a lot. When I think of a lot of birth workers, whether it's a doula, a midwife, a doctor, an OB, a nurse, meddling, just the constant need to meddle. And birth is not something that needs meddled with Unless it does. Like, things can go wrong. Things can need to be adjusted. But usually they don't. If the woman is healthy and she's taken care of herself, educated herself, and she's not fearful of birth, and if she's been around birth especially, so she's been exposed to it, she kind of knows the way that women move through birth. And the whole thing just doesn't take her by surprise. So she's doing her thing. Don't touch her. Don't talk to her. Don't meddle with that woman. And I see so much meddling. So that's number one reason why for me personally, I do not have a midwife that I've hired is because I would be furious if someone meddled with me in my own home as I'm giving birth. And that's happened before actually in the birth center, my third birth, I was so prepared like, oh man, a birth center. This is it. This is like the epitome of, of going natural. I've, done, I've already had two vaginal births. They're gonna just let me do my thing. This is gonna be great because I don't like to be talked to or touched during birth. And that just wasn't the case in the birth center there touching all over me, wanting to do just constant <laughs> touching, checking. And the thing is, I was only there for 45 minutes before I had the baby and everything was fine, normal. I mean, normal, if you want to use that word. Like, I, I'm not going to get into breach and all that because that can be normal, but like baby was head down. Things were going just fine. Why do they need to be touching all over me and, and almost kind of like freaking out? There's that that just like panicked feeling with a lot of birth workers. So if you're a birth worker and you're watching this and feeling attacked, don't, because maybe that's not you. Maybe you are a birth worker who remains calm and grounded during birth. And you, you even during a situation that might be a little tricky, you keep your cool. Amazing, I know birth workers like that, that's wonderful. 
but most of them aren't. They're so, oh, they spaz and they meddle. So I don't want that. Not only do I, I not want that, I would get angry and I would tell somebody off. And I don't want to be doing that to people. That's not fair. That's reason number one. Reason number two is, um, you know, the last time I actually did interview a couple of midwives because I was, I knew it would be my first home birth and I was thinking I would go that route. I would hire a midwife. But there were certain skills that were not present in the midwives that I, I interviewed. And the reason, the only reason that I personally would want a midwife, I don't want anyone rubbing my back. I don't want anyone talking to me or telling me any affirmations. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're the type of person who wants to be left alone, you need that to be respected. <laughs> so I don't want a midwife to do any of that. The only reason I would want a midwife is for an emergency. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> it's just somebody to assist during an emergency. So when I started asking questions, and, and you know, I live in the rural Midwest, so the selection of midwives who could come to my home, it, it's not great. There are a few, but it's not like a huge selection. The skills just weren't there. Like I had more skills. And I'm not saying I have more experience because I, ha I definitely have not attended as many births as these midwives, but I'm talking about resuscitation, um, handling hemorrhage, even just diagnosing a hemorrhage and, and what that means. I feel, I felt more comfortable answering those questions than they did. And even little things like palpation. Palpation means feeling your belly to know, just that palpation just means like feeling, you know, the body to diagnose something. But with pregnancy it means feeling your belly to know the position of the baby. Um, you know, I've had friends come to my house and I do that for them because they're not really confident in what their midwife says. And I don't mean to say all this to bash midwives. That's not what I mean. There's so many wonderful midwives out there, but what needs to be understood is that a lot of these midwives started out as nurses, labor and delivery nurses in the medical model, highly medicalized. And that is what was ingrained for years is treat with medicine, birth is a disease, something's gonna go wrong, we have to monitor, 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 intervene, intervene. And then these labor and delivery nurses, they might have been great at their job, but their job description was way off on <laughs> what should have been happening. But then, you know, they, they pursued higher education and went to graduate school for midwifery and carried that mindset with them. So you guys know this, like everyone, looks at our medical, modern medical system today. And, and what's one of the biggest complaints? It's like you're in and out in five minutes and they just write you a prescription for a pill. They treat you like a number. They don't even look at you as a person or as a patient and look at your body, feel your body to see like if what you say hurts or is wrong is actually wrong. The same thing applies in midwifery. They're trained in that system. They carry it from being a labor and delivery nurse over into midwifery to where they're looking at charts and numbers and they're not looking at the person in front of them and with birth especially i understand that there can be situations where a woman might have a um, congenital problem or a serious disease where she's super high risk and she needs some advanced care um, and that's great that that's available but for the majority of just regular healthy Women, they don't need to be treated like they have a disease. You need to look at the woman in front of you and, and be able to evaluate the baby. These are two people, not just numbers on a chart. So, you know, those are that's a long-winded answer of why I do not have a midwife is because I don't like people meddling with me when I'm giving birth. And I personally feel competent enough to, number one, prevent a lot of things that could go wrong in birth like hemorrhage I feel pretty good about preventing that and then number two I feel good about treating it and number three I feel really good about when to make the call on if I would need more help like if I would need to transfer to a hospital we're about 15 minutes from a hospital that could do whatever I needed done that's not far at all so I feel good about all those things I feel confident with that and it's just something that I've made the choice and I'm at peace with but I just wanna say this again, I actually don't think that that is the right choice for most women because it takes, you have to take a radical amount of responsibility for your situation if you make this choice. Um, you can't, you just say, oh, well, you know, 
this is what I'm doing and I hope it works out knowing that you're like a, a, an anxiety prone person or you're a person who kind of shifts the blame. If you have those characteristics and then you're putting it all on yourself to birth your baby, if something happens that's out of your, that, you know, doesn't go according to what you visualize, like maybe you end up with a lot more pain than you thought and you want to transfer or something, you're going to really struggle taking responsibility for that. So it takes, you have to be able to take 100% of the responsibility for your health and the baby's health. And I, I, I don't know if that's the right choice for a lot of women. Even if you are a person who's super reasonable and takes accountability, you probably just don't want to deal with it, to be honest. I mean, I have a lot of friends who have six, seven, eight plus kids, and they've got enough responsibility. This is not an area that they are super passionate about necessarily as far as the healthcare side of it. They love babies and birth, but uh, you know, maybe just not super passionate about the healthcare ins and outs, and they don't wanna have to worry about it. That's why midwives exist, so hire a midwife if that is you. <laughs> but anyway, let's move right along. We're gonna talk about my birth box. It's under my bed. That has all the supplies that I will use or need for my home birth and more because sometimes I'll go to maybe somebody else's birth and I keep things on hand that they might want me to bring that I wouldn't necessarily use for myself. Then I have my postpartum cart right here and a couple other things. Honestly, that's pretty much it. Fifth baby, there's not much nesting I had to do. So when you like I've been watching my latest nesting videos, it's me just spring cleaning, doing what needs to be done seasonally because there's just not much to do. I did pack up my load up my cart here. But I think first let's go through the birth box because birth is going to come before postpartum. And before we talk, talk about birth, let's just chat a little bit about prenatal care. So I've already gone over my prenatal um, supplement routine several times with you guys. I'm not going to do that again. I will link one of the videos up in one of the corners and in the description where I've gone over that. And maybe I'll link a list of like the supplements I take. But once again, that's something that you need to do your own research and think about if you have any um, particular needs for supplementation. But I do put together my own supplement routine and I drink uh, like a prenatal tea every day and I eat a ton of protein. That's a big part of my nutrition game plan to prevent hemorrhage is lots of protein in the prenatal period and the tea that I drink is, is another big one. So as far as prenatal care, I do my own prenatal care meaning that I just am mindful of my health. Um, it's not something that I just think about like once a month, like if I were going to an appointment. Every day, I'm mindful of my diet and my lifestyle. So I try to get exercise, sunshine, good food. Some days I fail at that. Um, every day. And then as far as checking on me and the baby, like specific to pregnancy, you know, these are all things that can be done at home. You can take your blood pressure at home, and I do. You can check your own heart rate at home, and I do. You can even listen to your baby's heartbeat at home, and I do. Every single thing that they do at the doctor, you can do at home. Home birth midwives do these things when they come to your home for a visit. And then even some things you might choose just not to do at all. So one thing that I don't do at all is I don't use Dopplers. And that is because it's not necessary to have a Doppler to hear the baby's heart rate. There's actually, um, this is called a fetoscope. So it's a stethoscope specifically for listening to the baby's heart. Now, it can be tricky to pick up the baby's heart tones before 20 weeks. So for people who are super anxious to hear that heartbeat at like, you know, six, seven, eight weeks, however early they can do it now, yeah, you're gonna have to go into a doctor or midwife that has a really powerful ultrasound or Doppler. But like I said, those things, those have risks. And I, I have some serious concerns, especially about the ultrasounds and Doppler use in the very earliest weeks of pregnancy when the baby is so teeny tiny. If you want to learn more about that, there's a book called Gentle Birth, Gentle Mothering. It's by a former uh, physician. She was a physician. And then through her own, own births, she did a lot of research and learned a lot of things that they just don't teach. So I'll link that book. It's a great read if you want to learn more about the risks, benefits of ultrasound and Doppler. I don't use a Doppler. I can listen to baby's heart tones whenever I want with my fetoscope and there's no risk to this. Um, I you know, set a little timer on my phone and can see what the baby's heart rate is. 
So when you're earlier on in your pregnancy, your baby is lower, your belly is not as big, so you have to lay totally flat and listen on your bare belly. So let me show you the parts here. Okay, these are actually meant to be used by somebody else. It's not meant to be used by you. Because this curved part here, the person who's listening puts their forehead here and puts this against your belly. But you don't have to use a, your forehead. You can use your hand and that's what I do. I just put my hand over this part here, press on my belly and like I said, if I was 20 to maybe 28 weeks and my stomach was smaller and my baby was lower, I, I would have to lay flat and have a bare belly to really hear it. And even then it might take me a little while to locate the baby's heart. If you're really good at knowing what pos where your baby's positioned, you can usually pick it out right away. Now that my belly and my baby is huge, I can listen right over my dress, sitting up just like this. And I know, I know my baby's head down, so I can just find the baby. And listen, and uh, I listened earlier, the heart, my baby's heart rate was 144. So, you know, if you want to hear your baby's heart three or four times a day, you can go at it. I don't listen that often. Maybe every few weeks I'll pull this out and I'll just listen to baby's heart. But, you know, you can feel the baby moving. That's a great way to know your baby's okay. If they're, if the movement's great, then the heart rate is going to be good too. So that's something that I do as far as just prenatal checks. And I do have notes in my phone because I think it's really cool to go back and look different pregnancies, like what was this baby's heart rate at this week or whatever. So I do kind of keep track and I'll, I'll take my blood pressure and track my weight. That's not something you have to do, but I do that anyway. I just keep track of my weight because um, I work out and I like to do it. <laughs> I like to keep track of my weight. What else? You can measure your fundal height right? That's basically how big your belly is to see how you're measuring. If you want to do that, I don't do that. At this point, I know what my belly looks like. After five times, I, I would know if it's a lot bigger than it usually is at a certain point or a lot smaller. I just know, so I don't do it, but you can do that. You can also get, you, you can even go as far as to test the protein in your urine. You can get home tests for that. You can do your own blood glucose monitoring at home. Um, you can do rapid a rapid test for group B strep at home. There's just so much you can do. You can do all these things at home. And I will actually link, there's a online store, I, forget, I always forget what it's called, but I'll link it where you can get all these supplies to do all your home birth stuff. Now, if you have a midwife, then your midwife's gonna have all these supplies. But that's pretty much it for prenatal. Like I do, I check on everything that, that a midwife or a doctor would check on, except I don't do cervical checks. Um, the evidence is not there that those are beneficial at all. There's actually, uh, the only thing that's happening there is, is potential harm by introducing infection. Nobody's hands should really be um, entering inside of your body unless it's an absolute emergency. That is a huge infection risk. And so, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's a violation, especially if it's a man doing it. And I, I, I'm not going to go into that today, but I have very sincere concerns about the amount of men in obstetrics. I think there's a time and a place for a skilled, a man who's like a skilled surgeon, an obstetrician or something, but the amount of men that go, and, and, and this, this isn't just me speculating, this is looking at data of obstet, uh, obstetrical abuse and rape and um, some things that have been found, it's, it's really concerning. And that's not saying that they're not skilled. That's what makes it really tricky is a lot of times the male doctors are more skilled than the female doctors. And once again, this is not an opinion. This is looking at data. There's there's data for everything, right? So most of the time your male obstetricians are going to be more skilled, but there's some, there's some concerns there. So gosh, now I got off on a tangent. Anyway, no cervical checks unless there's an emergency. Do not let anybody put their hand there. That's, that's, nope, nope. Just shouldn't, shouldn't be doing that. And, um, you know, they, they, providers are also known to do membrane sweeps without consent as well. So that's another reason just to avoid all that. So I think we've covered uh, prenatal, prenatal care. There's nothing else I really want to say about that. Let's move on to the birth box, the actual labor and the birth.
This is fun. Oh, I gotta get up now and move my camera. All right, so I keep this box under my bed. There it is. <laughs> you can see it. And all of my birth supplies are in here. I will say, if this was just for me, I wouldn't need this big of a box. I don't know even if I would need a box at all because I personally don't need much. But like I said, sometimes, you know, somebody will call and ask if I can come if they're having a baby and I just keep stuff for that. So we'll go through this box and I'll tell you what I use or what I, you know, plan on using and what I don't. So right as I open my box, you're going to see these big blue bags. These are Chuck's pads and um, essentially... Yeah, they're just, you put them under mom while she's having the baby and they make cleanup really easy. They're disposable. You do not need chucks. You can just use old towels. Old towels work fine. Um, one reason I like having chucks is just because, you know, if for whatever reason, my mom and my sister <sighs> come to my births, but if something would happen really quickly and they wouldn't make it and my husband is the one cleaning up, like I'm not putting that on him <laughs> to, he would do it. But I'm not making him mess with towels. I'm just going to make it as easy as possible for him to pick up these disposable things, put them in the trash, and be done. So chucks are just easy cleanup. But once again, if you don't need them, you can use towels. Towels work just fine to put under mom. And, you know, one thing is just making your life easier as far as cleanup. So like, let's say mom's having a water birth or she she's gonna give birth in the bathroom or something, or she did give birth in the bathroom. Now she wants to walk to bed um, to avoid a mess on the way, like maybe ruining her a rug or carpet or a floor, make a trail of chucks pads or towels for her to walk on. Just practical things like that. So that's why I have those. This is for me. This is a shower curtain. It's just a cheap plastic liner, shower liner. And it, this is for um, my bed. If I go into labor and, you know, I it's nighttime and I want to rest in bed, I'll just put this on under my sheet in case my water breaks. So, like, I've got waterproof sheets, but I don't know if it, can, it could withstand that. So just that way I don't ruin my, my bed or anything. So this is, like, a couple bucks. Very cheap practical thing to do then again I'm not going to sleep with this on my bed leading up to birth because I'd be uncomfortable so if my water breaks first to start off labor which that's only happened to me once with my first birth then it is what it is I'll just clean up the bed <laughs> it'll be fine all right next up this is just a little sling for weighing the baby and I actually have it's not in here I have a scale it's a fish scale <laughs> a digital fish scale and these little hooks hang from the fish scale. You put the baby in and you weigh the baby. You actually don't need to weigh a baby. Believe it or not, the baby will survive. And actually, it won't impact the baby's health at all if you don't weigh the baby. So you don't have to weigh the baby unless you are really concerned about breastfeeding or something and want to monitor weight gain. But I have it. I think it's kind of fun to know what my babies weigh. So we will be weighing the baby. See, I do have a Doppler. So even though I don't use the Doppler, I have a Doppler. <coughs> and it's something um, I have in case somebody I know, you know, wants to use it. Or I go to a birth and they want me to bring it. I always ask if I'm going. And, like, I'm not, I'm not a certified midwife or anything like that. Not licensed, but, you know, I'm just here. If somebody in my community needs something in particular, they know they can call. And if I'll just say, what would you like me to bring? And usually I've talked to this person before and they know what I have and what I will and won't do. Like I'm not going to do any medical care on anybody. That would get me, that could get me in trouble. But I can go and be with someone. I can loan them my Doppler. I have blood typing kits. Um, these are kind of handy. I didn't use it last time and I probably won't use it again. I don't have a reason to use this. But if you wanted to grab your baby's blood type, then it comes with a little syringe. Uh, there are directions. You could just pull right out of the umbilical cord, get baby's blood, and see your baby's blood type. So that's pretty neat. And it, and it can be done without poking the baby. You don't want to poke a baby. Why do we poke babies? Our skin is like our first line of protection. It's a barrier. You don't want to poke it with needles. So you can get your baby's blood type without poking. All right. These are just alginate dressings. 
They're, they're like kind of non-stick wound dressings and they're for tearing because you don't want to put something on a tear that is going to stick, that would hurt taking that off. <laughs> so calcium alginate dressings. I've never experienced tearing before, um, but I've, you know, given these to other people. So I just have them. And you know, that's with home birth, you almost never hear of like a third or fourth degree tear. That, that's something that's usually caused by things that are done in the hospital that cause the woman's body not to birth in a natural way, whether that is Pitocin or an epidural making her not be able to feel her pel pelvic floor and pushing, or whether it is um, the use of forceps or an episiotomy. Those are interventions done in the hospital that cause tearing. The hospital and giving birth on your back, that can cause tearing, just not being allowed to move. So in home birth, tearing is pretty rare, but when it happens, and it does happen, it's usually just like a first or second degree, like a little little bitty guy that you don't, no stitches, nothing like that. Um, a little dressing is just fine. All right, what else do we have here? Now, this is just an air pump for my birth ball, and I do have a birth ball. I love it. I don't like sit and bounce on it. I actually like to have it to lean over during birth, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It's like the best position ever to if you have back labor, and I always have back labor. Um, hakas, you guys know what hakas are. Oh, these are dirty. I'll have to have my mom wash these after I have the baby. I'm not gonna get everything out now. I, my cart is already full. Um, I've got a regular stethoscope. This is just a not a fetoscope, a regular stethoscope for, I can use this on the baby after the baby's born if I want to listen to heart tones and listen to lungs. And, um, you know, it's really easy, actually, I think, then again, I did do this for several years in my job, to listen to heart tones and hear if anything's abnormal. Uh, you can even look on YouTube. And that is actually where, when I was in nursing school, a lot of our assignments were on YouTube we would have to listen to different heart tones and they were videos recorded by teaching hospitals and they post it for, you know, public access on YouTube. So anyone can go on YouTube and find like a really good reputable cardiac source and just learn a little bit about heart tones, learn about fetal heart tones, about newborn heart tones and what that would sound like if it was normal versus abnormal. And then you can do it. You can listen to your baby. So pretty neat. I do have cord clamps. And I also have this little box for cord burning. If you don't know what cord burning is, you can just look it up. It's essentially just where you burn the cord to cauterize the end, which totally eliminates the risk of bleeding out through a cord if a clamp is kind of loose. So I do both. I burn, I cauterize, burn the end of the cord, and then I put a clamp on as well. Just one last thing to worry about. Um, I have these bulb syringes, but I don't use them for me. Just have them for other people if they want them. Like I'll usually throw one of these in my bag if I go to birth. But for me, if I needed to suction a baby, I would do use my mouth and create a tight suction over the baby's nose and mouth and do some suction that way. And uh, that's gonna be more effective. It's just gonna be more effective than one of these guys. Have some medical scissors. This is for the cord, for whatever. These will be sterilized before the birth because they've been in this box. Everything's been in this box. Uh, this is a manual blood pressure cuff. I prefer manual blood pressure as opposed to the little automatic ones. That's just me. It's kind of hard to do on yourself, though. So, what else do I have? Um, gosh. That is pretty much it. I've got, like, an herbal sits bath mix. You can get these from a million different places for afterward. And that's something that my mom and my sister will do for me is like after I have the baby, I'll just lay in bed for a really long time and they will help clean up and then get a bath or a sits bath ready for me when I'm ready to get up and kind of wash off. And that's what we'll do. And then I'll probably want to lay down and not move for a long time. So that is pretty much it. I do have a bag valve mask that's for resuscitation. It's like a fancy uh, piece of equipment for resuscitation, right? You put the little mask over the baby, squeeze the bag. I wouldn't use that for me. I just have it. And I've actually had, I've been asked to bring it when I came to a birth. So some people would rather use that, but I think that if a baby needs rescue breaths, and I think the evidence is really good for this too, that the best thing to do is for the mother to administer those breaths. So once again, with your mouth, you would just give the baby breaths.
And that's something that you can also look up on YouTube. I'm not gonna sit here and break down a tutorial on how to do that, but it's really easy to do. There's a lot, you're a lot less likely to hyperinflate the baby's lungs. So one of the things with those bag valve masks, even the baby ones that supposedly, you know, or should prevent the you from giving the baby too much air, they make me nervous because, you know, you could, you, you could. I've seen it happen. Give the baby way too much air with those. The mom is a lot less likely to do that when she administers the breaths herself. And it, it's just better outcomes. Um, it's always better when you can have mom's skin on baby's skin and mom doing what needs to be done if that baby needs a little stimulation rather than plastic, cold plastic and gloves. It's going to be shocking to the baby. It's not going to cause the baby to thrive and come around any faster. Um, stimulation from the mother is what's going to do that. All right, so that's my birth box. I think that's pretty simple, especially since most of that stuff I wouldn't use. Oh, here's one more thing. Depends. Ladies, you can mess around with pads if you want. I'm just saying. Depends are better. They're easier. They're better. Just look into it. And actually, you don't need to do disposable ones. You could, I mean, you could even do like the period underwear. Some of the period underwear is toxic though. So look into that. They make like natural ones. You don't want toxins in a time when your body's flushing things out. So look into that if you don't want to go the disposable route. Just look at period underwear. Now, I obviously haven't had the baby yet. So there are probably going to be more things that I put on my cart. But it's basically good to go. I'm sure you guys have seen the cart hack absolutely genius. We use these little carts for homeschooling. All my kids have one for their books. So when I have a baby, I just steal one and use it for my baby stuff for a few months. It's just for a few months that I keep this by my bed um, to minimize getting up and down at night, really, to minimize getting up and down at all, especially in the immediate postpartum period right after you have baby. You want to get up. You want to stretch out a little bit, move around, walk around, but you just don't want to have to be like getting up for every single little thing. So having, whether it's a bedside table that is stocked up or a cart is really, really handy, but especially for nighttime. Because you know, one thing that's not talked about is if you sleep with your baby and night nurse, your baby might sleep through the night from day one. My last baby did until teething started. <laughs> and then we like, then it was the night waking and all that. But um, so yeah, if you can, keep everything in arm's reach at night, you might not have to get, get out of bed at all, which is so nice for recovery. It makes you just so much more well rested. So let's go through this cart. I would say one of the number one things you're gonna need to keep by is water. You need to stay hydrated. So whether you're a water drinker or whether you drink jazzed up water, which I've told you about my jazzed up water before, keep a big cup. It doesn't matter what you have, just some kind of really big cup close within reach so that you can stay hydrated. You really need to stay hydrated while you are nursing a baby and recovering postpartum. So I've always got my cup in here. Um, got my fetoscope sitting here now because you know I'll listen to babies sometimes. Another thing is light. So if you do have to do a diaper change or you're working on latching baby, you're gonna need a little bit of light. I have this red light. It's actually a book light. So click it on there. You can, it can get brighter or dim. And I like this because I don't like to keep my phone in my room and I don't want to turn a bright light on like a lamp and red lights just better at night for a baby circadian rhythm and for mine. So these are super cheap. I think they're like under 10 bucks. I actually have one of these little red book lights for all my kids too. So all my kids, my big kids lights out at 830, but they're welcome to stay up and read or write or do whatever as long as they want they but they can only have their red light so we love these little red lights i just have this clipped on my cart here this is what i'll use if baby needs anything at night and i need a little bit of light now i also have diapers so i do cloth diaper we've gone over that in previous videos i've got my little cloth here i've got i'm not going to go through all the all of that but i've got blog posts on this i'll link them for you in the description just tap more a more button and you'll see all the links for everything I'm talking about. So I've got all my supplies for cloth diapering. That's down on the second 
shelf here. Um, I've got my cloth wipes. I use cloth wipes and a little, I kicked it earlier and it went somewhere, but it's like a little spray bottle. So let me get that and I'll show you. There it is. Okay, so this will have water in it. This is a cloth wipe. When I need to do a diaper change, I will spray the wipe, not the baby, because otherwise it startles the baby and uh, the baby cries. You don't want the baby to cry. So I'll get the wipe wet and then clean the baby up. The dirty diaper will go in my wet bag here. That I get the ones that just like hang, you know, you can strap them on to the cart here. So unzip, put the dirty diaper in, put the new diaper on, and then we go back to sleep. And that's if we wake up at all. Like I said, my last one slept straight through the night. I do have a few disposable diapers, but even if you're planning on using cloth, a lot of people just like to use the disposables for until meconium, the meconium passes and until the baby loses the cord stump because sometimes the cloth diapers can kind of rub up against that cord stump on the baby's belly. So I've got a few disposables here. I didn't end up using them last time I had a baby, but they're here. Uh, and it will never cease to amaze me how tiny little newborn diapers are. My babies are all pretty average size, so they will be a newborn size, like seven, eight pounds or so. I don't have super huge babies. All right, so that's my diapering supplies. Now, with cloth diapers, you really don't have to worry about diaper rash, but I do have um, baby balm here. Yeah, it's called Baby Balm. It's from Earthly. I've got a code for them, and we've talked about Earthly before. I love Earthly. I've got all my Earthly stuff here. So I'll link that for you guys. Let's see, what else? I, because I do cloth diapers, I think, actually I think even if you do disposable, sleepers are the best for baby. So they're just easy, you don't have to worry about pulling pants and shirts on, just put the baby in the little sleeper. So I keep a few clean sleepers in my cart, that way if baby spits up or has a blowout or something then I can just grab another sleeper and we're good to go. Um, other things, I have really long hair as you see and you know, I am gonna have my hair up at night probably because you know, it can be just be a pain. So I just have this little mason jar full of all my balms. Let's see, from Earthly. It's like, uh, my, and my chapstick. You gotta have chapstick because you just do if you're a chapstick addict like me. So I've got my chapstick in here. I've got my milk flowing salve baby balm and breast balm. I don't know if I'll need these, but I've got them in here if I need them. And my, yeah, my hair ties. All my hair ties are around that jar. So I've got claw clips, like clipped off the edge of my cart. It's just little stuff like that. You, you don't want to get out of bed for, you know? So just anything that you, you use, you know what you use, put it on your cart. These are Silverettas. They're little silver caps. Um, that go on your breasts and they're to prevent nipple irritation and infection um, or just soreness from latching. You know, breastfeeding shouldn't be painful, but even if your latch, if the baby's latch is perfect and you're doing everything just right, those first few days can be super intense because even if you've done it before, you haven't done this in a while, unless you're tandem nursing, then the transition's easier. Um, but it's tandem isn't something that I'm personally interested in, nothing against it. But yeah, these can be handy. Just put them on in between nursing. So, you know, basically when you're not nursing, have these on just for the first few days or, or until engorgement passes, which engorgement usually takes um, maybe a week to be all said and done with, maybe two weeks. If you've had interventions like an epidural or a C-section, it will take longer. And none of this, like when I say these things are my opinion or to me to knock epidurals and C-sections, um, I actually, used to be certified as a lactation uh, consultant, but I dropped that because that organization uh, went woke. All of the lactation organizations went woke and they don't, they want to erase women. So I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna call women birthing people or um, chest feeding people. And so I'm not gonna be certified with, with you if you say we have to do that. But anyway, when I give you information like oh, it could take longer for engorgement to pass. If you've had a C-section, this, this is just science. This isn't me being biased or anything like that. It's something that you need to know. You need to be prepared for that. 
so and and epidurals because you're getting a lot more fluids so this is something that let's just talk about this really quick this video is so much longer than i thought it would be i'm sorry but let's talk about this because this is so important if you get iv fluids during labor you have to remember that during pregnancy your blood volume has already increased a lot you've already got like at least 50 percent more blood volume so you've got a lot more fluid and blood in your body than you would anyway and now you're giving that woman a big bag of fluids, usually several big bags, like liter bags, right? It's got to go somewhere. And where it goes is she gets swollen. She gets really swollen and the breasts are not exempt from that process. So the breasts get swollen too. So then, and this happened, you know, this is epidural and C-section. You're getting a lot, large amount of fluids with both. So you've got engorgement that happens, which is normal. Engorgement is normal. It's nature's way of sending an abundance rather than not enough um, and it passes but you've got engorgement and then because of the IV fluids you've got swelling on top of engorgement and that can make latching near impossible um, it can make the nipples almost invert it can make a lot of things happen <laughs> it's called third spacing you can look it up there are things you can do to relieve it but it's very difficult so anyway when we're talking about fluid nursing Silverettas engorgement. So that's just a little bit of uh, information on, on breastfeeding, nursing, and engorgement. So I think that's my top shelf here. I have my wipes, my spray bottle for baby's little bottom, my balms, my chapstick, my water, my hair stuff, an extra outfit, my red light. I've got my dirty diaper bag, my wet bag strapped on here. I'll link all the videos for when I talked about cloth diapering in the past. Um, Second shelf is my actual cloth diapers because they're flats and covers, they take up more space. So, you know, yeah, the whole second shelf of this cart is dedicated to that. And then, let's get back to me and see it. The third shelf, I just have baby clothes. I have some little swaddlers. Um, these are all old. Like, I just use the same ones from baby after baby because they're still good. I mean, they're newborns, they don't get things that dirty. And also because it's really sweet when you've had a lot of babies to like get your baby stuff out and think back to all the little baby faces that have been wrapped up in these little blankets. Oh, I just love it. So yeah, just, just swaddlers, clothes. And I did treat myself to a new Solly baby wrap this time. I love my baby wraps. I've got all different kinds. I've got wovens, I've got structured carriers. And then I've got the stretchy wraps. I like the Solly stretchy wraps for newborns and um, little babies under six months, but especially under three months. In my opinion, the stretchy wraps are just so great. Now, one thing about these stretchy wraps from Solly, which I have a discount code for them. I think it's Stephanie 10. I'll check that. And if it is Stephanie 10, you'll see it come up on the screen. And I'll link, I'll you know give you my link and get a discount from Solly. I've used Solly for my last three babies, but these stretchy wraps are so lightweight. I think I have a video on how to how to put them on. They're so lightweight, breathable. They work so great for brand new babies, but you cannot wear a baby on your back in one of these stretchies. You have to wear a baby on your front, which when they're little bitty and they don't have head control, and it's basically like you're still pregnant, <laughs> except somehow it feels a lot lighter. Well, because you, you've lost a lot of blood volume, you're not carrying the placenta or the amniotic fluid or anything like that, it's just the baby. So, yeah, I forget what this pattern is called, but I love it, it's really pretty. Check it out. Very neutral, we don't know what baby is. So, it's it's neutral, it'll go with my clothes. So I'll use that for the first three months almost exclusively, unless I wanna go milk our cows. I am not gonna put a baby on my front when I'm milking. So if I have a little bitty baby and I want to go milk, the baby will go on my back in a woven wrap. And you can look up tutorials on how to do that. But you actually can back wear a newborn and a tiny little baby before they have head control. You just have to use a stronger fabric like a woven rather than a stretchy. So that is it, you guys. I mean, um, yeah, that's it. Long video, but I think we covered it. I have, oh, I need to wash this since it's new. Set that to the side. You saw over there when I had the camera facing the other way, a little cradle. I do have a little cradle in my room and I have some fabric that belonged to my husband's grandmother. She passed away this past year, but it's really pretty. So my daughter and I are gonna make some little sheets for that cradle. 
I've had that cradle. Uh, the baby won't sleep in there at night, but it's here for like if I'm making my bed or if I just want to set the baby down for a minute and do something or like if the baby ends up being a really good napper, independent napper. So most, most babies love to contact nap. They want to nap on you. And that's one reason wraps are so great. Just put them in the wrap and go get all your, do all your things. Now, if this is your first or second baby, nap when the baby naps because you can do that. But when you have older kids, you can't do that. So you just put the baby on and go. However, some babies will be like fabulous nappers. You could just lay them down and they nap. My last one was like that. I could lay him in the cradle and I, I lay him on their belly because babies sleep better on their belly. Back to sleep is a horrible campaign and that I, I'm excited for one day when that's all shown to be just completely false information because it is. It's harmful information. It's causing plagiocephaly to children's heads. It's causing children's heads to be misshapen and, and that can be painful going through. They have to wear helmets if it can be corrected at all. Um, so it's a harmful campaign and really what's happened is that the campaign was made up to shift the blame away from vaccines and onto belly sleeping as far as infant deaths, which is a tragic thing, but it's not okay to make up reasons why it happens so that you can continue profiting, you know, for the pharmaceutical industry. But anyway... When I do lay my babies down for a nap, I lay them on their belly and I don't put stuffed animals. I, I do follow, like, there's some common sense stuff. Like, you don't put stuffed animals and big heavy blankets around a baby. Of course not. Just in what they're wearing on a um, flat surface or whatever. So I've got that. Got my little cradle. And last but not least, I got my car seat. So this is a Maxi Cozy. I've used Maxi Cozy for all my babies. I did have to buy a new one this time because I left my my old one out in the garage and mice ate it. Why did I do that? I don't know. I should have put it in the basement, but I just kept saying like, oh, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And here we are two years later. <laughs> I go up and get to it and it's disgusting. It's like chewed through and destroyed. So I got a new Maxi Cozy, same car seat. I know what I like at this point. I like Maxi Cozy um, mostly because it's lightweight. I think it's, if not the most. It's one of the most lightweight car seats on the market. So, you know, if you're gonna be carrying baby at all, you don't want that extra weight. So that is why I chose that. And I think that wraps up this video. You guys have seen, heard about my choices that are probably a little controversial, but that's okay. Not everybody has to agree. I don't have to agree with everybody. That's the beauty of, um, you know, I guess just having different opinions. Not everybody has to agree. And we've gone over prenatal care a little bit, the birth box, and postpartum. I think that's it. I didn't get around to showing you my birth ball and like laboring position, but this video has already dragged out long enough. And if, <laughs> if when I make a video on the baby's birth story, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about alleviating labor pain and positioning and stuff like that. But for now, I'm going to sign off. And hopefully when I see you guys next time, there will be a little baby in my arms.